So I took this doubling every year and extrapolated it 10 years from 1965 to 1975 from 60 components to 60,000 components on a chip. First thing you have to tell him is, yeah. guys, we've been giving you a free ride for 30 years <laughs> while you write your crummy software and we made it faster. Right? That's, that's over. The future is parallel. Single cores are not getting any faster. to uh, CSE 141. Uh, so uh, I'm Professor Usaki. Well, this is actually the name that I'll be using online. And physically, my name is Hong Wei Chen. And uh, today is the first lecture of CSE 141. I know a lot of you are excited to uh, join this class. So uh, first of all, before uh, we start, uh, I do want to encourage you guys uh, to uh, I know this is because right now we are moving online, so we cannot meet you guys in person. So uh, we don't have a lot of chances to know each other. So why don't we take this chance uh, to talk a little bit about ourselves. So first of all, I want to know what's your name and what's your favorite topic in computer science and why, why are you taking CSE 141? So uh, first of all, like, uh, let me, like, uh, like, let me try, right? So my name is Hong Wei. Uh, and or say Professor Usaki. And my favorite topic in computer science is definitely computer architecture because this is the class that I'm teaching. And the reason why am I teaching CSE 141 is just because, you know, like I love UC San Diego so much. When somebody asked me to teach this class, I just want to teach uh, our students at UC San Diego. So that's the main thing, right? So right now I'm going through uh, the participant list and, and I, really re like you to uh, tell me your name, your favorite topic in computer science, and why are you taking this class? So the first one that I see is Alan Wiley. Uh, okay, well, my name's Alan Wiley. Uh, favorite topic? Um, I actually don't know. Uh, maybe data structures and algorithms. It's pretty interesting. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm taking this class because it's required. Okay, that's the answer that I have heard the most. All right, so next one that I have in... So the next one that I have uh, on the list is... Anwar uh, Ali Ahmed. Yeah, hello, I'm Anwar Hi. and my favorite topic Honestly, I'm kind of torn between graphics and computer architecture. Um, I just mm -hmm. really like that low level capability involved in like both of those. Um, uh -huh. And aside from it being a requirement, uh, I really would love to learn more about computer architecture in general so I can get a better understanding of maybe like where the future is going with the technology. Seriously, are you interested about computer architecture? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like my primary interest. Like I wouldn't do- You know, like, you, you know, like yeah, one thing, like useful. everybody lies. Uh, you are not lying, right? <laughs> oh, I, okay, no, I'm not lying. Um, especially with things like uh, GPU, like playing around CUDA and stuff like that, mm. seeing- Oh yeah, it's highly related to graphics, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's sort of sparked my interest because working with graphics, it's kind of low level a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So. That sort of brought me more towards, you know, getting, you know, I initially had like a fear at the start of learning more about like that nitty gritty computer architecture stuff, but seeing how low level things like OpenGL and things like that are, 
I realized how okay. important it was for me to understand, you know, the architecture behind everything. So all right, great. Yeah. All right. Okay. Look forward to more of your presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, the next one I have is Anish. You should be unmuted. Hello. Well, for some reason I cannot unmute you. Okay, so I have Arman. Yes, I, uh, I'm Arman. Uh, my favorite topic, uh, I'm not sure about my favorite topic, but I'm in, interested in learning computer security. Okay, and why are you taking this class? It's a major course, I haven't had that. Okay, so it's a requirement, right? Yes. Okay, so I have, uh, who is next? Uh, Byron? Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Byron, and uh, my favorite topic in computer science is probably, I guess, well, stick to like, you know, the hot topic, which is machine learning. Uh, okay, machine cool. learning. Okay, yeah. pretty cool. Um, yeah, but, I agree. Yeah, uh, 141 is going to be interesting. I, I'm taking it because it's a requirement, but it's also okay. really important to know how everything works. And especially if you want to okay. dabble in security or anything, you should know. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the next one is Colin. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. My name's Colin Drews. Um, I'm taking this class because. I do research related to side channel hardware security attacks, and I think this is really applicable. Uh -huh. The areas of interest that I'm mostly interested in is computational complexity. Okay, and why are you taking this class? For the research purposes, I think it'll For be the useful. Research. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Devi, Devi Saul. Uh, hi. Uh, um, my favorite topic in Computer science, probably machine learning, especially computer vision. Mm -hmm. I'm taking this class uh, for major requirements, but I'm still pretty interested in it because uh, it's one of the things I think I really wanted to take going into college. So mm -hmm. I still figure out like what's the interface between hardware and software, and how they turn like uh, digits or bits into mm -hmm. actual like comprehensible programs. So I'm still pretty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so next one, uh, Frolin. Fro hey, what's up? Yeah, Frolin, what's your name? Uh, Frolin, uh, uh, my favorite topic, I'll say machine learning because I took it last spring and I really enjoyed it. Okay. And um, I'm taking this class because I need to graduate. You need to graduate because yeah. it's required. Okay, got it. Uh, Giovanni. Hello, my Hello. name is Giovanni. Yes. Um, my favorite topic in computer science, I'd say, is uh, computer graphics, although I haven't took those courses yet. It's just that I have a lot of experience with like 3D game art and kind of video game development, I suppose. I'm taking this course because it's a requirement, but I mean, I'm interested in just computers in general. So we'll see how it is. OK. Guo uh, uh, Yi. Hi. Hi, my name is Guo Yi. Um, so, the, my, I think data structure is my favorite. Uh huh. The reason I take this uh, course, I think because uh, it's one of my the major requirement. Also. Okay. okay. Thank you, Harris. Hello. 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 Uh, hello. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't huh? plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> That will help. Um, so my name is Harris. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite topic in computer science, um, I guess I would say it's architecture in the sense that I found um, 140 and 140 LTP very engaging and interesting to me. Okay. But I also have such limited experience with it that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm willing to accept the fact that, you know, in five weeks, I'm going to completely change my mind and say, oh, architecture. No, I will that you feel like this is a, this is, this is definitely more interesting than 140. And 140 in my mind is not computer architecture, it's hardware. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yep. 
again, that's just more proof of the fact that I really don't know what I'm talking about. So I am well, interested that's fine. in classes. Okay, <laughs> um, thank and, you. Yeah. Why are you taking this class? Because it's required? Uh, because it's required and also because I don't really know, you know, what I plan on going into research and it's kind of hard to go into research if I don't really know what I want my topic. Okay, so that's why I definitely want to learn it. And because this is a big <laughs> building computer science, so that's why we put this in as a required class. Mm -hmm. All right, next uh, I would have Jia Chen. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Hello. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm Jia Chen uh, and uh, my major is computer engineering. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason why I taking this class is because of my uh, major requirement. And the mm -hmm. more impressive uh, thing to me is the WWDC uh, 2020 and uh, paper pen to, uh, uh, Apple Pen to uh, repay uh, the, CP, the CPU for the product in future, completely in future two years. And I think in the future, the CPU, uh, the CPU uh, is completely different uh, to the CPU we, we are using today. So I think it's, 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 uh, it's the game changer. So yeah, and I and my favorite topic uh, in computer science is, um, uh, is machine learning. Uh, okay. uh, and, 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 and deep learning, yeah, thank you. Okay, and why are you taking this class? Uh, because it's my uh, major requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right, so let me see uh, who is next. Jay, Justin. Justin, hello, are you there? Hello, somebody there, somebody there. Justin, okay, I cannot hear you, okay. Uh, Karthik, oops, sorry. Oh. Yeah, uh, I can't hear me now. Oh, yeah, I'm Karthik. Um, my favorite topic in computer science has been uh, interaction design. And I'm mm -hmm. taking this course because it is a major requirement. Okay, thank you. Very honest, very short feedback. And uh, how to, uh, Ka Kashyap, am I doing it right? Hi, it's Kesho. Um, Kesho, okay, sorry yeah. about that. That's fine. Um, my favorite topic in computer science, I guess, uh, I would say is cybersecurity. And I'm taking this class uh, for a major requirement. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let me see, um, who is next? Uh, Kevin. Uh, hi, I'm hi. Kevin. Uh, my favorite topic in uh, computer science is machine learning and I'm taking this mm -hmm. course as a major requirement. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one, I have uh, Kun Yi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Kun Yi, and I think my favorite topic is machine learning and data structure. And I'm taking this class because it's requirement. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one, let me see, Luke. Hello. Hello. My name is Luke Somerville, and um, I would say my favorite topic is probably algorithms, mm -hmm. data structures, algorithms. And then um, I always find hardware pretty interesting, but it's mm -hmm. just also a major requirement for this class. Okay. Okay. Which is fine. Um, next one. Uh, let me see. Matthew. Matthew. Oops, sorry. Oh, yep. My name is That's Matthew good. Zane. Uh, my uh -huh. favorite topic is probably machine learning and algorithms. And I'm uh -huh. taking this class because uh, required. Okay. That's Michael. Michael. Hi. Uh, my name is Michael. My favorite topic is machine learning. And I'm taking this course because it's required by major. Okay, thank you. So let me see, Nicholas. Hello, Nicholas. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Nicholas. Uh, my favorite topic is uh, algorithms and I'm mm -hmm. taking it as a requirement. Okay, thank you. So let's see, uh, August? 
Is that the right pronunciation? I don't think so. Tell, tell me how to pronounce your name. Oops, we keep bouncing each other around one more time. Hoi. Oops. Okay, perfect. Here we go. Yep. Oh, my name is Oz. So the G is silent. Oz. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Oz Sayim, and my favorite topic, computer science, is probably security and cryptography. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking this class as a major requirement. Okay, thank you. And uh, oh, M -N O Richard. Hey, I'm uh, Richard. Hey. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite topic would have to be algorithm design and mm -hmm. probably data structures as well. And mm -hmm. I am taking this because it's a major requirement, but I mm -hmm. do think I'll enjoy it. Okay, thank you. So I have Rigo Berto. Yes, uh, I go by Rigo just to keep it short. Uh, okay. So so far, my favorite topic has been uh, has been deep learning, mm -hmm. and I'm taking this class because it's required. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have Roger. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I'm Roger. My favorite class would be uh, algorithms, and mm -hmm. I'm taking this class because it's required. Okay. Uh, Sahil? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, my name is Sahil, and uh, a topic that I'm interested in so far is machine learning. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking this class as a major requirement, but I also think it's important to study this because um, the architecture design of a system has a huge effect on the performance. So it's important okay. to know how to optimize the software based on the uh, system. Okay. Uh, then I have Sai. Ooh, are you wrong? Hi. Yeah. Hi. So my favorite topic in computer science is probably data structures. Mm. And I'm taking this class because it's a major requirement and it's also probably interesting to just learn more about the architecture and how to optimize. Okay. So I have uh, Su Jing. Are you Hello, um, I'm Su Jan. Uh -huh. Oh wait, I'm I'm sorry. Well, okay, we have two. Well, uh, I'm I'm gonna go next. Okay, so uh, Su Jing, go first. Oh uh, hi, my name is Su Jing, and my favorite topic is algorithm, especially uh -huh. related with computer vision. And the reason I'm taking this course is because uh, it's re major requirement, and also I think it's like the hardware and architecture is really interesting. Also, it's like mm -hmm. very difficult. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sujan, your turn. Oh, okay. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sujan. Um, so I'm still uh, exploring my interest in computer science. So mm -hmm. I basically um, do not have any like favorite topic so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm taking this course because my major requirement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, to ma uh, to mass Jen. Is that the right pronunciation? I don't believe so. I'm so uh, yeah, My name is, hey, uh, my name is Thomas again. Hi, everyone. Uh, say, uh, say it again. Thomas again. Thomas again. Okay. Yes. Learned. <laughs> okay. Uh, my favorite topic would be uh, algorithms. Mm -hmm. And I'm taking this course for a major requirement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next one. Tian Ye. Tian Ye. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, okay. Everyone. My name is uh, Tian Ye. So my favorite topic in computer science so far would be uh, computer graphics. So I'm taking this class also for a major requirement. Okay, so uh, Wen Xiao. Hi, my name is Wen Xiao and my favorite topic in computer science is algorithm and time complexity. And the reason I'm taking this course is because of the major requirement because I need to hurry up to fulfill my full year plan. Okay, so I have Yi Ting. Hi, uh, my name is Yi Ting and my favorite topic is data structure and I'm taking this class for a major requirement. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, so I have Wang Yi Han. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yep, perfectly. Hi. I'm Yihan, 
And my favorite topic currently is um, natural language processing. And mm -hmm. I'm doing research in, in this direction right now. So I'm oh, taking okay. this class for a uh, major requirement. Okay, thank you. And let me see who is next. Uh, I have uh, Yi Ting, Yi Han. Okay, Yue Chen. Oops, Hi, I'm Yu Chen. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, cool. So my favorite topic in computer science would be computer graphics. I took one uh -huh. of the class of computer graphics. That was like the most time consuming class I ever taken. That's like uh -huh. both painful and interesting. So I like it so much. And okay. I'm taking this class because of course the requirement is the most important thing. And also I'm looking forward to learn something interesting in this class. Okay, hopefully we will have that for you. All right, so next one, Boya. Hello, Hi. are you wrong? Hi. Yeah, uh, I'm the TA, I think. You're the TA, <laughs> yeah. So that's why we need to introduce you. Uh, so um, I'm turning my fifth year PhD and mm -hmm. I work on biosignal analysis and wearable sensors also put in AI like machine learning and deep learning into healthcare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why are you TAing for this class? <laughs> because my intern got canceled. I need to earn my oh, money. Oh, <laughs> that's too sad. Okay. Okay, got you. And uh, well, Boya will be our TA and she will be leading uh, uh, discussion sessions later uh, and more information will be revealed on Piazza later. Okay, so is there anyone I haven't uh, go through you, but you still, but you also, but you want really want to like introduce yourself to the rest of the class, just raise your hand. There is a raise hand function uh, in Piazza. Okay, so well, D. What's your, um, what's your, how, what, uh, what? Hi, my name is Twee. Like it's Twee? like how a baby can't say tree, Twee. Okay. Um, I think my the classes I've enjoyed taking before is CC one hundred five because mm, I do like uh, computation theory. Yeah, that and also CC one thirty because mm -hmm. I really like the professor and also I liked. Learning. Who is that Very. professor? Who is that professor? <laughs> Rented Jala. He's hilarious. Oh yeah, I like him too. <laughs> and I really liked um, actually getting down to the basics of um, a language. Um, mm -hmm. That was fun. And um, is that supposed to say CSE 144 or CSE 203? Well, CSE 141. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was confused. Um, taking this because I need to graduate. <laughs> Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so uh, thanks everybody. And uh, anyone else? I think we have everyone else, right? Everyone, right? So, uh, yeah, so, um, so uh, the thing is, like, a lot of you, well, saying about, like, you know, like, what do you really like, right? So, uh, and I think uh, you guys are really honest, so I don't have to tell about, like, how frequent. Uh, people in the states are telling a lie, but, uh, but think, uh, if you are if you are interested, well, you can search it online, and you will figure out that on average, uh, for anyone in the United States, we tell six lies per day. So, um, but uh, what's your favorite topic in computer science? If you ask this question to people, here's the list, right? So I asked this question to Google. Here's what. Uh, Google would say like artificial intelligence and robotics. I heard a lot of you talking about this. Uh, like our uh, our TA is doing stuff in bioinformatics. That's on the force and cybersecurity. I heard quite a few of you on this and computer assisted education. I haven't heard anyone talking about this. Uh, probably you think, well, we are already doing this kind of stuff all the time. And for uh, the big data analysis analytics, I think it's also uh, sometimes people uh, also do this together with machine learning because right now machine learning is everywhere and a lot of stuff cannot be separated. Okay, so, uh, be, so a lot of you are um, like, uh, very, well, say, saying, uh, claiming that you are interested about machine learning. So uh, can somebody raise your hand and tell me about like, you know, who was the, uh, who is the uh, Turing Award uh, winner for 2019? If you are, 
if you are in machine learning area, it's probably not uh, too hard for you to guess, right? Like, can I have somebody telling me the answer? Like who wants um, Turing Award last year? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Well, actually not last year, sorry about that. Um, uh, I should be, well, sorry, uh, two years ago, 2018. Yeah, I keep thinking about this year is 2019. All right, for 2018, who, who won the Turing Award? Can somebody raise your hand? Who won the Turing Award last year? Somebody raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. Or you can Google it. All right. Do you want to say something? Hello? I think our students are answering on the chat. What? They are answering on the chat. Yeah, but I, I want I want I want I want people to talk. All right, raise your hand, talk like what you just did. Okay, so I have Harris. So I don't, I'm not entirely sure and I didn't want to Google it, but what's it, didn't the guy work on like ImageNet, the whole database for- Yeah, I Wasn't think, it like, it was Jeffrey something? I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Jeffrey Hinton, right? So it's actually not just Jeffrey Hinton. It's a, it's a collection of people. It's uh, uh, Jan Lacun, Jeffrey Hinton, and uh, Yosha uh, ben, Benjo, right? So these are the three people won Turing Award uh, two years ago. And the reason why they won it is just because uh, now like, what's the, what's the most popular algorithm in, well, what's the most uh, popular machine learning model nowadays? Like uh, Harris, any comment? Um, I have no clue, I would. Oh, okay, but what type of models? Okay, David. Uh, this is just a shot in the dark by convolutional neural network. You, yep. Right, so the neural network is uh, is 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 the most uh, uh, popular uh, uh, type of machine learning models nowadays. Right, so Jeffrey Hinton is one of the winner of the uh, Turing Award in 2018. And let's see uh, what what kind uh, like this. Let me share a, a few words. Well, a few sentences that uh, he mentioned in his Turing Award lecture uh, two years ago. I think a lot of the credit for deep learning really goes to the people who collected the big databases, like Fei Fei Li, and the people who made the computers go fast, like um, David Patterson and others. All right, did you hear that? So uh, he, he said that a lot of the credit, uh, the success of machine learning, go, well, the modern machine learning model like deep neural network, it should, uh, it should also be shared with people like Fei Fei Li. And, uh, Debbie Patterson, who built very, very fast processors, right? So, and in fact, in 2017, right, the Debbie Patterson and uh, John Hennessy, right? So this is John Hennessy, this is Debbie Patterson. And well, there is someone in the middle of that, that's me. Like, uh, so we, we took a photo together and Debbie Patterson and John, John Hennessy, they are actually the Turing Award winner for 2017. So uh, what they did, what, 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 what John Hen Hennessy and Debbie Patterson did, have you ever heard about their name somewhere? Like, do you know who they are? By how much you know about Debbie Patterson and John Hennessy, just raise your hand. You must heard about them. All right, uh, Nick. Hello, Nick. Oops, sorry, Nick. Hello. Hello. Yep. Uh, David Patterson wrote the book, right? Wrote the book, John Hennessy. 
Uh, I'm not sure. Well, both of them wrote a book, right? So if you look at the, 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 the cover of your textbook, right? So you will see, right? This is uh, like, this is John Hennessy, Debbie Patterson, right? They, they are both on your book, right? And uh, according to what uh, Jeffrey Hinden's comment, right? What it tells you is that, well, why computer architecture is so important? Why we have uh, computer architecture as a required course in uh, the CSC department? Because like, well, people say deep learning is very important nowadays. It's a, the future is about like machine learning. Okay, I accept that. But who make this uh, coming true, is uh, come true? It's just because we have computer architecture. Right, and if even though like a lot of you are saying that okay, I don't care that much about computer architecture, but here's your everyday life. Like okay, you probably play these games at uh, when when you are doing social distancing, right? And well, for me, like this is also one of my favorite game that I will play every day. So so the thing is like computer architecture. Without this, right? Some of you mentioned computer graphics, and um, um, uh, without this, the, it's not happening. Right, so computer architecture is very important as a power, uh, as as a back uh, foundation to power the rest of the computer science. Okay, so what is computer architecture? So first of all, if you go uh, to uh, the dictionary and try to search for the definition of architecture, you will figure out that well, computer architecture is very important. Right, the fifth. Uh, the fifth comment here is like the manner in which components of a computer or a computer system are organized and integrated, right? So this is computer architecture. So, uh, so it's, if, you, if you see uh, this sentence, you will find a lot of uh, keywords like components, organized, integrated. So that's what the class is going to be about. We are going to talk about uh, what are the components uh, we have in a computer and how are we going to organize them and integrate them to, uh, to, uh, to make your computer efficient. So before we start the rest, we have to know what are those component, the components, right? So if you, if you, well, a lot of you still have a desktop computer, especially those of you who claim yourself as a very intensive gamer, right? You would have a desktop computer like this. And if you tear the desktop computer down, right? You will find a motherboard and on top of the motherboard, you will figure out, well, this is the place you can put a processor, uh, you can put a few DRAM slots, and you can uh, connect a few peripherals, including uh, like GPUs, and uh, if you want to play games. And uh, also you need uh, peripherals to store uh, your data, like your uh, hard disk drive or solid state drive to uh, put your games, to put your video content, to put whatever you want to use. Uh, in this computer. So this is the basic computer structure. You have processor, you have DRAM, you have peripherals, and you have data storage, right? Now let's go through a little bit, right? If I have a server computer, this is like a, a, two, a one use server. Uh, so if I have a server, like uh, my lab also bought one server recently. So um, like you, you, you can check the motherboard, right? It seems it's a bigger motherboard, but if you just figure, if you just try to dig into the detail of what the motherboard is doing, you will figure out that well, it's just uh, a, a board that can host more processors, more DRAMs, and but you still have the peripheral connectors as well as the I/O connectors, right? Okay, so a lot of you don't have a server, don't have a um, desktop computer, but you might have a laptop. So if you look at the laptop, well, even though how, uh, no matter how small it is, no matter what kind of architecture it is using, uh, you will see it still have a processor, it still have DRAM, it still have uh, peripherals, including data storage, and it also have IO connectors, right? Well, uh, I know uh, there's a new iPhone coming up, but you know, uh, this is still the latest iPhone you can purchase online. Uh, well. Uh, nowadays, right? And for, 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 for this iPhone, right? If you tear it down, you can still find a processor, you can still find DRAM, you can still find uh, peripherals and IO connectors. So this is the iPhone. Well, I know PS is also having a new version, right? But uh, if you look at the current version of PS4, uh, you will see like, okay, you still have a processor, you have DRAM, 
you have peripheral connectors and you have the play, uh, you have also have the IO connectors. If you have another, uh, if, if you don't think you are an intensive, intensive gamer, but you want to do some lightweight gaming or you want to, um, it, well, like have some party games, you probably have a switch. And if you look at a switch, well, it's small, but it still has a processor, it still have DRAM, it still have peripherals uh, and uh, IO connectors, right? Well, people, uh, I don't know how many of you have this. I don't have one, right? But if you have, um, if you have, if you have, uh, if you have a Tesla, right? It's well, you can still see it as a computer, and indeed, Tesla is really uh, a computer in a way that if you find out the most important component uh, in this Tesla Model 3, it has a motherboard like this, and again, it has processor, it has DRAM, it has I/O connectors, it has peripheral slots, right? So this is uh, this is Tesla Model 3, right? And so right now, you see, we see a lot of different examples on computing and uh, but everyone has processor and memory, right? So why? Why processor and memory is everywhere, are everywhere? So let's talk about a little bit about the history, right? In the very beginning, there's nothing. Well, one day, well, uh, somebody, well, some, someone say there should be a light and there should be a light and blah, 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 blah. At some point, well, uh, they let people like uh, discover like well, Abacus and uh, Difference Engine and uh, like ENIAC, that's the first modern computer, right? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a computer that has been invented uh, in World War II. And it's, it's a Turing complete machine, it's a digital computer. So it's con considered as the earliest uh, digital computer, which could solve a large class of numerical problems through reprogramming. So people say it's the, it's the, it's, a, it's the ancestor of uh, uh, modern computers. And when they say reprogramming here, you are thinking about, okay, when I say reprogramming, uh, you, you can write a program like uh, Java or something. No, at that time, what people really mean by programming is that you have to play with the hardware. Uh, you have to reconfigure the hardware to let the machine have the different function. And in a, in a very, old time, right? What happened is that if you want to use a computer, you have to line up like this. So um, you can imagine the world is completely different from what it is now, right? So why the computer can be uh, really like uh, what, we are, uh, what we are using today. Can you name someone who built the foundation of modern computer, uh, I would say programming model, well, programming model, or say the computer system model, computer architecture model. Who built that? Like, well, we said Turing, right? Turing is, I would say, uh, he built the foundation of computer theory. But how about uh, who built the foundation for computer system? Can you name one person? Do you have in mind who would be the person? Okay, I have Byron. Yeah, I think his last name is Church. Church. Is it okay? Or no? Okay. Who else? Okay. I have a Noah. Yeah, thinking uh, Neumann as in like the von Neumann architecture. Okay, von Neumann, right? Okay, great. Exactly. So von Neumann, he is actually the one who built the foundation of architecture. So every machine nowadays is actually an implementation of von Neumann machine. So what? what's really inside the idea of von Neumann machine is like this. So uh, in von Neumann machine, your computer should have at least a processor and a memory. And, um, but if you want persistent storage, uh, data storage, you should have storage devices as well. So that's von Neumann architecture. So for the von Neumann architecture, what they really do is this. Well, you can have your program and data inside a storage and a program has its own instructions and static data. So whenever you need to execute a program, first of all, your system will have to load your instructions and runtime data into your memory. And the processor will fetch these instructions uh, according to their program counter order. And then um, if we need data, we fetch the data accordingly to, uh, according to their memory addresses. So this is, the, this is the basic idea of von Neumann architecture. 
And when you finish an instruction, you keep fetching the next one. And uh, the, the magic of von Neumann architecture is that by loading different programs into the memory, your computer can perform completely different functions. So just change the program. You don't have to reconfigure the computer. So uh, that's, and this, this, this machine architecture is, is fascinating comparing with the, the fact that you have to uh, reconfigure your hardware in the past. And uh, all you need to do is that you need to have a computer with processor and memory and just give the memory different content and your computer can act completely different. So that's, that's the good thing about von Neumann architecture. However, most of the time when you say, when I'm using this von Neumann uh, computer, I don't write uh, instructions myself. I am uh, writing a uh, program. I'm writing, I'm writing uh, programs in C or some other language. So how does that get translated into uh, the instructions? So if you have a C program, right, you will definitely use a compile. Well, if, if you just have the program itself, just have the source code, it won't run. So you have to first compile. And then uh, the compiler will generate uh, programs like this, right? And this would be in a storage. And uh, once you have that in a storage, the rest of the story would be the same as the von Neumann architecture, right? So you have uh, the compiler and you have a linker that links other library objects together as the resulting program. And then uh, the rest of the story would be exactly the same as the von Neumann architecture. And uh, I know our uh, CSE 8 uh, class is using Java. So I suppose you guys are more familiar with Java. Can somebody tell me like, um, thinking about von Neumann architecture, how Java would drive the von Neumann architecture to work? Can I have some of you? Like if I wrote a Java program, how the Java program can be running on a computer? Okay, I have Byron. Hello? Oh, sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> okay. But do you have an idea? Do you want to say something? Because uh, it um, runs on the JVM. Um, on JVM, okay. But how can we generate a code to run on JVM? We convert it to bytecode. Okay, convert it to bytecode. But uh, who who convert the stuff to bytecode? Uh, it's, is it not the JVM? Java compiler. Oh, yeah, yeah exactly, compiler, right? Yeah. So we have the Java compiler. And again, the Java compiler would generate a machine code. And uh, uh, the, But this machine code is not a machine code that's running on a von Neumann machine. It's a Java bytecode running on the Java virtual machine. And again, if you need external library, uh, what would happen is that uh, the Java virtual machine, when you launch this program, uh, it would dynamically link other classes together uh, when you are running this program. So this is the this is the basic idea of how Java program is running, right? So like okay, uh, I launched the program, and as long as I need another class, it will be imported during the runtime. And uh, I am using the Java virtual machine to translate uh, the Java virtual machine instructions into the machine instruction and the rest of the story will be the same as the von Neumann architecture. But how about Python? A lot of you use Python nowadays, especially those of you who are working in um, machine learning, computer vision or whatever, right? How does the uh, Python program become a running program in von Neumann architecture? Anyone, any idea? Raise your hand. I'd like to hear your voice. It's better than reading your words on the chat. Someone. Okay, I have El, uh, Ellen. Uh, uses an interpreter. It compiles and then executes it one line at a time. Right, so you have interpreter and uh, it compiles one line at a time during the run time. So it still generate a program, but it's just doing this at the run time and uh, dynamically put it into the memory of your system, right? So, uh, can you, so you can see that, right? Every computer, no matter what kind, of, uh, uh, what kind of programming language that you are using, it's essentially the von Neumann architecture in a way that uh, we use 
uh, we use the we use memory uh, to store your program and code, and your processor will fetch stuff from the memory. So it sounds like memory is a very important, uh, very important uh, component. And if you have take uh, CSE 140, you know this is memory, and we store can we can only store zeros and ones on there. So uh, if you have a number, you okay, uh, Harris? Uh, do you have anything to add, Ellen? Do you have anything? Yeah, so going back to the uh, Java code interpretation where the compiler mm -hmm. converts it to Java byte code, I'm a little mm -hmm. confused about the connection between the Java byte code and the Java virtual machine and that connection to the von Neumann architecture. So does okay. Okay, the virtual so machine contain the architecture? Is that what's... No, so virtual machine, uh, so... Okay, so Java virtual machine is another... You can think Java virtual machine is another machine. Okay. Right, and it has a different, well, hmm, good question. So Java Virtual Machine itself is also a von Neumann machine, but it has a different instruction set. And Java Virtual Machine has its own virtual memory, has its own virtual processor. And if you want to run the Java program on the real machine, the Java Virtual Machine has to translate uh, the instruction from its own architecture to the underlying architecture. So that's how Java program runs. All right. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me see. Um, okay, so uh, in CSE 140, this is you know about memory, you know, well, memory is something that you can store uh, zeros and ones. And if you want to represent a positive number, you know, I have to deal with this binary translation and uh, it's okay for positive numbers. And if I want to deal with negative numbers, uh, we have a new number system code uh, uh, tooth complement, and the reason why we want tooth complement is because it's obvious representation. You have efficient usage. It has equal coverage. It has easy, easy hardware design. And with that, we can design uh, we can design a hardware that works uh, easily for both positive numbers and negative numbers. And to make the addition faster, you have to deal with uh, hardware design like this. And this is called carry lookahead head adder. And uh, well, if you want to store floating point numbers, you have to deal with IEEE 7.54 format. And, uh, and using this format, if you want to re represent negative 10, well, you have to encode your bits like what we've shown in the slides, right? And uh, if you want to perform uh, hardware, uh, well, if you want to perform addition on uh, the FF uh, floating point, uh, you probably have to build a hardware like this. And uh, if you want to, uh, and uh, if you want to build a processor, it requires register file, it requires ALU, it requires memory, and everything has to be controlled by the clock. So uh, this is the this is the this is the stuff. Well, so after I said about this, uh, you probably feel like no, CSE 141 is not a class, but no worry, right? This this are this is these are all not about. Uh, this class. So CSE 141 is nothing about that and uh, uh, nothing about those previous nice slides. So if you are thinking about this as an extension of CSE 140, I don't think you are at the right class. Um, however, if you are thinking about other potential, uh, 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 but so, so first of all, this is not, uh, well, the previous nice slides are not, is not, is not something we are going to talk about in CSE 141. We are going to talk about something else, right? So before we talk, uh, mention on what is the something else, let's talk about uh, the challenges in von Neumann architecture. So we all accept the fact that von Neumann architecture is uh, universe right now, right? And a lot of you uh, have already heard about Moore's law, right? Especially these days when people are talking about stock market, uh, people are talking about Intel, right? You heard the Moore's law many times. So can I have some of you you must hear about Moore's law, right? So you don't have to Google it. Just tell me about what's your understanding about Moore's law. What is Moore's law? Raise your hand. Okay, I have Byron again. Oh, actually, oh, oh yeah. Um, I think the number of transistors in a CPU doubles every year. Okay, every year. Okay, what else? Okay, Harris, what do you think? Um, my understanding was that it would double every two years. Every two years. Okay. Nick, what do you think? Uh, I 
I think it's the size of it, the chip would half every year. Okay. What else? Uh, I have a tweet. Am I yeah, I think my understanding of it is basically it's prediction through empirical research. But I was going to mention the double thing, but everyone already mentioned that. So I just wanted okay. to. Okay. Okay. Karthik. Uh, yeah, I think it also says something about the cost of computers goes down over time, too. Okay, all right. So I guess you guys have the right understanding about Moore's Law. But if you if you really want to uh, spend time dig into the detail of Moore's Law, uh, it's actually in one of the paper that Golden Moore uh, wrote in 1965. And here's the reference. You can probably Google it. So what it says is like this. So right now, I'm going to give you a very, very quick overview about what a paper is about. So First of all, uh, he wrote a paragraph about, okay, I see inter integrated circuits are in uh, increasingly popular. And ICs are well established and they are more reliable and they are, they are going to be smaller and um, they are going to be easy and easier to manufacture and they are getting smaller and smaller. And uh, heat is not a big issue. Uh, designing ICs can be relatively easy and which you will be learning in CSE 141L as well using Verilog and you will know it's really easy. Well, I think I lied today, right? And uh, ICs are widely applicable. You can use it anywhere. And well, so that's more slow. And the most important thing, right? Um, so the most important thing is that, right? So uh, the, the high level idea, so some of you say one year, some of you say two years, both of you are right because it's actually one to two years. So the number of transistors, number of transistors that we can build within a fixed area of silicon doubles every 12 to 24 years, uh, 24 months. And if you check, uh, if you check, if you check uh, the, the transistor count, uh, things, uh, the paper, you will figure out, well, more slow is still growing. And even though for now, we are still able to uh, cram more circuits within the same area, but, it's, but some of you were thinking about like, okay, in the past, right? Everyone, every time when Intel uh, have a new generation of processor or AMD has a new generation of processor, we are supposed to get better performance generation by generation. But right now, well, we do get performance uh, improvement, but it's only about like 10 to 20%. Right. So uh, in the past, it, it's really the case like, OK, before 21st century, we can get like 52 percent improvement on average. After that, 23. Uh, then for uh, early of the decade, it's about 12 percent. However, recently, it's only about 3.5 percent per year. So what really happened here is that, OK, we, we do have the process technology. We do keep the more slow going on. However, uh, we are not able to make the, the CPU is faster. Uh, we are not able to make single CPU core is faster. And David Patterson, you just heard about his net, right? What he said. The future is parallel. <laughs> single cores are not getting any faster. Right, the future is parallel. Single core is not, are not getting any faster, right? So he, he he, he, he just declared the death of single core performance improvement, right? So uh, single core is not getting any faster. So instead, right, we try to build uh, multi-core processors. So the first multi-core processor uh, commercially available, that's AMD Alstom 64X2, that was 2005. And then Intel Nihalian has the first quad-core processor in 2010. Spark, uh, which is actually uh, originally uh, developed by Sun and acquired by Oracle later, uh, they have a, a 16 core processor at the same year as Intel roll out uh, the, uh, the quad core processor. And then we have the, Niag uh, the NVIDIA Tegra processor uh, with five cores. And then AMD have uh, soon, soon uh, roll out another 16 core processor uh, in 2011. So that was, uh, so that tells you that, well, because we cannot get single core performance uh, uh, significantly improved, so we try to build multi-core processor. However, even with multi-core processor is not sufficient. 
So now we have built heterogeneous computer architecture in addition to processor, conventional processor, memory, and storage, we start to have uh, other stuff like we have the GPU, we have FPGA, we also have the tensor processing units from uh, Google. So for GPU uh, is accelerating graphics for sure. And right now people are using it for machine learning. However, uh, for, for, for Google, they recently discovered, well, they, sooner, they soon discovered that um, GPU is not sufficient. So they built their own uh, tensor processing unit. That would, that's a specialized chip for machine learning, uh, for neural networks training, right? And if you have some other stuff, like saying that I have uh, the demand of processing uh, a specialized task, and but I don't, I'm not, like, I'm not as rich as Google, so I cannot build my own processor. So what I would be doing instead is that I would have, uh, I would build an FPGA. Uh, I, I would build stuff on top of an FPGA. And uh, if you are interested about like how to do FPGA programming, then CSE 141L is the class, right? So that's the, that's the thing. However, processor is not the only problem we need in uh, monumental architecture. Memory also has a problem long time ago. So this graph shows you the performance uh, in terms of uh, the latency of uh, uh, serving a request between a, a, a processor and memory. So as you can see, well, processors start to slowing down after 2005. However, memory keeps growing, but the curve is just so flat in such a way that we have seen a big gap uh, uh, between the processor and the memory performance, right? So um, as you can see, right, if you look at this heterogeneous computer architecture, everything require the memory to work. And you, even though you have the fastest TPU, you have the fastest GPU, right? Everything has to go through this very, very slow memory. So if you uh, cannot deal with the data movement very well, even though I have the fastest tensor processing unit, I have the fastest GPU, your computer is going to slow as well. So uh, that's why you should care about computer architecture. So uh, before I talk about this, right? Tell me about a few things that you do care when you are writing a program. Like, can some of you raise your hand? What do you care when you are writing a program? Okay, what's the most relevant, Harris? Um, time, like big O time, how fast oh, it takes. Oh, big O time. So that's the algorithm, right, David? Uh, I just make sure that it's correct and it meets all of the edge cases. Uh huh. Okay, edge cases. What else? Who else want to express your mind? What do you care? Okay, I have Karthik. Uh, like readability and maintainability. Readability, maintainability. Okay, what else? Uh, Tui? Um, I guess it would be like, I don't know what the word for is, it is, but basically that it's easier to change over time. Like it's okay. not resistant to change if you need to. Mm -hmm. Okay, easy to debug, easy to program, I guess. Right, so these are the stuff that you guys care. You care about algorithm, you care about data structures, and a lot of you talk about how uh, the readability, right, software engineering, that's it, right? Some of you care about user interface, right? But most of the time before this lecture, when I talk about computer architecture, I know this is what you think. Right, so you, like before taking 141, I guess most of you don't think computer architecture has anything to do with your programming. So right now I'm going to give you a demo, right? So some of you saying that you are interested about, uh, you, you think big old notation is very important. So tell me about this code, right? So uh, if, um, if I have, well, what's the, what's the big O notation for, uh, for, for this, uh, this sort, like, like what's the fastest sort that you can implement using a, using a CPU? Like what, and what's the, what's the big O notation for it? What's the complexity of it? Someone tell me about that. Okay. I saw on the chat, Harry's, you said older and log n. Right, so it's older and log in. And how about this 
this part. What what's the complexity of it? What's the complexity of it? Raise your hand, raise your hand. What's the complexity of it? Okay, I have Harris. Wouldn't it just be O-N? Yeah, it will be O-N, right? So you guys are really doing very, very great in learning uh, algorithms, right? So this is O-N. Okay, so Harris, can I have you uh, here a little bit? So if, okay, so for this program, I have a parameter called option, right? So if option is set to one, what's the complexity of this code? Hmm. This whole program, if the option is set to set one, to what's one. the complexity of this? this oh, program? well, it's going to be O and uh, log to N. Because okay, what if, the option is, what if the, the, the option becomes zero? Uh, well, then it's just going to be O N. Right, so if the option is uh, one, then it will be, um, it will be order N log N. And if it's only zero, then it's only going to be an order N. Right. So from the algorithm's perspective, uh, if I set the option one or option zero, which one would be faster? Harris, an idea? Um, well, from the algorithm's perspective, it would be faster if option was zero. Okay. So let me show you the demo. Let me show you the demo. So. Um, so let's see, right? Right now I have this program and this is exactly the same program that I show you here. So I have, I set an array size so that I don't have to input a parameter. I have an option from my command line. And um, this program is the, exactly the same as the one that you have seen uh, in, uh, in the program, except here, I just changed uh, the array size a little, well, so the program uh, that I put on the slide is array size times uh, a thousand, but here, because I want to generate a random seed every time when I set a threshold, so uh, I, I put uh, another for loop outside, but because this is a constant and this is, uh, this is a linear traversal, so it's older, it's technically orders uh, a constant time, well, it's, uh, it's actually constant time uh, times uh, older uh, n, right? So this is older n. And as you guys said, if I set the option to be zero, then uh, the program should be older n. And if I set the option to be one, then it should be older n log n. And what your CSE 100 teacher would tell you is that, well, if, or, or 101 teacher would tell you is that, well, the lower the complexity, the better the program performance, right? So that's, that's use time to see how much time if we are running this program in older n, okay, it's pretty fast, it's 0 0.5. But what if I made it older n log n? Did you see the time? It's no, right now only uh, 0 0.236, right? If you have it as older n, older, older n, it takes 0 0.5. If you have it at zero and uh, order n log n is only 0 0.2. So it's about twice faster if the complexity is higher. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Right? So if you really want to be a performance programmer, right? The first thing I would say, uh, forget about those algorithms. They are not, they are assuming that you are living in a world with a perfect computer. However, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not really the case, right? So uh, some of you mentioned about for large inputs, right? Uh, then I am going to show you another demo. So, um, so for, 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 for large numbers, right? We want to use sort first. And there are two types of sorting algorithm that I'm going to show you. The first one is merge sort. And a lot of you might already know uh, the merge sort performance is n log n, right? And another sorting algorithm, which I listed here is n log square n. So the complexity is higher, right? So, um, so, so the complexity of Bitonic sort is higher. And so if you use the algorithm's perspective, you would think, well, um, 
the so first of all, let's 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 tell you this demo. So for this demo, I have three different pieces of a code, and uh, uh, I have uh, input data that is sixteen that contains sixteen million numbers, and well, sixteen size is sixteen million. So uh, let me see what if I first uh, sort four millions of numbers, which I think is big enough, right? And uh, if I use uh, the microprocessor to sort it, right? It would take this amount of time, right? The microprocessor using quick sort, it takes about uh, uh, 0 0.5 seconds or say like uh, 578 uh, milliseconds, right? But if I am using a GPU, which I'm doing it right now, using merge sort, well, it takes 3.7 three seconds to sort it. So you will feel like, okay, you, my GPU is a garbage. But let me tell you this, it's just because you don't know the hardware architecture of the GPU. So you didn't use the right algorithm. So what if I use um, Bitonic sort? Then it turns out that the GPU only takes about 420 milliseconds to finish the sorting faster than the CPU now. And Bitonic sort is actually uh, in running in a higher complexity than merge sort on the GPU. So it tells you a lot of, uh, so I give you these two evidences and you can play with the example. Uh, I, I will put the code on GitHub. And uh, the truth is that um, your algorithm, your complexity is assuming that you are running on a perfect computer, that memory is not even slow and, um, and uh, your processor speed and the memory would match and which is never true, right? So, um, so, so it's not going to work in, in realistic. So, um, so uh, if you want to be a performance programmer, computer architecture is the class that you, wrote, uh, you definitely re need to learn. And let's see what uh, John Hennessy said about his comment about programmers who only know algorithms. So the first thing you have to tell him is, yeah. guys, we've been giving you a free ride for 30 years <laughs> while you write your crummy software and we made it faster, right? That's, that's over. Okay, so in, a lot, in the past, we don't think computer architecture is so important is because computer architects, we are such a nice, we are such a group of nice people that we try to make the computer as fast as possible so you won't be aware of uh, like your, your, your algorithm. If you don't design your a software to tailor for the underlying architecture, then your performance will be that bad because we keep hiding that detail. However, as what John, John Hennessy just said, it's over, it's over, right? So uh, most of the time, right? I, I know a lot of you probably like me watch uh, this cartoon in the past, right? So if you remember this cartoon, there is always a section like this. Okay, I give you part of the uh, Pokemon and guess what is that, right? So if you see this tail, right? You will probably guess, okay, I am having uh, a Pikachu that I can use. However, uh, what you really have is this guy, right? So if you keep thinking about uh, well, I, my Pokemon can do this, but instead the best way of using is, is, is this, right? Then you are not going to make your uh, usage of your, uh, uh, your, your, your computer or say your Pokemon very efficient, right? Or the other thing like, okay, saying about you have a Tesla, right? Tesla can do a lot of fancy things. You can accelerate uh, it. Uh, you can accelerate a Tesla uh, to very high speed within 10 seconds. However, if all you need do, all you do, you you are doing it every day is like, okay, I want to drive this Tesla uh, around the circle of UC San Diego. You don't actually need a Tesla. You pro a bike is probably better than a Tesla in some sense, right? So uh, at least you don't have to find a parking slot, uh, which is terribly hard if uh, we are back on campus, right? So um, so so that's why you have to learn computer architecture. And right now, what I'm going to talk about is that what we are going to learn in this class. So uh, we said every computer is, is a genius and we are going to uh, talk about uh, the performance issues. We are going to talk about the memory issues. We are going to talk about processor. We are going to talk about the parallelism. And the thing is that everything, as you can see here, everything has some flavor of software optimization that you can do to make the stuff going doing better, right? So, so, and uh, so this is this is the agenda that we are going to learn in this class. 
And this is a tentative schedule, and you can see it uh, through the through the web page. And uh, those stuff are subject to change, except for those uh, examination time. And right now, I'm going to talk about the learning experience. So most of the lecture today, uh, like the lecture that I have today, is like a news report. And however, I really like the lecture uh, to be uh, something like uh, like a like a game show. Uh, and I used to do that. However, because the coronavirus, so we cannot do that anymore. So I'm keeping thinking about like, what's the, a what's the better way to do things, right? So, uh, and this learning method that we are using uh, is called peer instruction in the past. Uh, well, uh, when, when we can do this uh, in person, but right now I'm also trying to do peer instruction online. So the basic idea of peer instruction is that I will have some activities to engage you uh, uh, during the class. So like I ask you guys to raise your hand to talk about what you think. This is part of it. And uh, the most important thing is that uh, I will give you a few questions for you to think, to answer, and uh, it will help you to practice your concept, bring out misconceptions and from your peers. And another thing is that, well, you will get credits from it. Like by attending half of the uh, class, you will get 2% uh, of your final grade. And uh, the reason why it's only 2% because I know a lot of you might have issues in connecting to internet so, uh, or, or have a stable internet connection. So I just put it as 2%. So I won't be punishing people who cannot uh, attend the lecture on time. So uh, the basic idea of peer instruction is like this. I will give you pop-up questions and you will have to think individually and we will do a dis uh, group discussion and we will have a whole classroom discussion later. So it's a process of read, think and discuss, right? So uh, this, is the, this is what the uh, peer instruction is about. Okay, so, uh, and we will give you some experience of using peer instruction in the next lecture. Um, and then, uh, but before we can do peer instruction, because we don't want you to discuss something in blind. So you have to, you have to read some material first. And I know if I don't assign reading quiz, none of you is going to read a book. So uh, that's why we have the reading quiz. And it's going to be on campus and, uh, uh, it's due before the lecture, and actually we have one next uh, before the next lecture. And there's no time limit limitation until the deadline, and you have two chances, and we took the we will take the average. And even though you miss one of the uh, reading quizzes, that's fine. We will drop your lowest two at least. All right. So uh, right now. Uh, well, we also have assignments that's uh, after the class and it's assigned on Wednesdays, due on Mondays before the lecture. And it, uh, it's the best way to prepare the exams. And it's also submitting uh, through uh, Canvas. So finally, some logistics. So these are the course resource. Uh, if you can join the lecture right now, I know you have problem, you, you don't have any problem uh, joining join us on Zoom. And, but if you, you really, like if you are traveling outside, if your computer uh, has some issues that you cannot use Zoom or you just don't like to use Zoom, then we do have YouTube Live, which is right now broadcasting on YouTube. And after the live broadcasting, you will also find a video on YouTube. So the repository will be on YouTube. And the content will be exactly the same. The only difference is that you won't be able to uh, uh, use the poll uh, that we have in Zoom. And uh, slides schedule will be on course web page. We have discussion forums shared with CSE141L on Piazza. And we have the reading quiz homework submissions on Canvas. And uh, the website, there's a calendar here. So if you want to figure out when the TA is around, and uh, when do we have the lectures, have the discussion sections, that's the best way to, uh, to check. And well, here's your instructor. So if I'm in real life, that's what I look like. And being a person who is sometimes do cosplaying like this, right? So, and this is a very good chance to do stuff online. So I would definitely design a character for myself. And that character is called Professor Usaki. And um, well, talking a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a PhD in computer science. Uh, well, I got my PhD degree in computer science department, uh, the same as many of you guys in UC San Diego. And uh, I'm interested about intelligent storage systems, uh, non-volatile memory, near data processing, and anything that could accelerate applications. And I have office hours on uh, this time uh, on Zoom. All right. And 
Here's our teaching assistant. Uh, she already introduced herself um, and she has office hour Wednesday, 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. and she will have discussion sessions uh, uh, most of the Thursday on 5 p.m. And in this class, again, you have to log in, discuss on campus uh, and uh, Piazza and uh, reading quizzes on campus is 18%. Come to class, 2%. Homework throughout uh, the course will be 20%. And uh, for the reading quiz, uh, we will drop at least two. For class, we only require 50. For homework, we will drop the lowest one. So if you have, if you, if you, so we give you fair amount of chances to uh, not performing well in uh, a few items. So if you are really busy on time, if you cannot submit anything, uh, uh, it's okay because we will drop uh, the lowest at least. Okay, Harry's question. Um, so the link on the CSE 141 website for the textbook leads to a fifth edition. Is it the fifth or the sixth? Oh, sorry, the fifth edition. So this is the, the, the book for a grad version. Sorry about that. All right. So this is your this is your task. And if you want to see your grading, it's on Canvas, right? So an error in grading, uh, you have a uh, uh, if you if you feel like the TA is not grading correctly, uh, uh, it means that you don't trust the TA. So just send me an email. And uh, some of you on the Zoom saying that, well, are reading quizzes collaborative? The answer is no. Right, you have to do it individually. If you do it collaboratively, it's considered as a cheating. So don't cheat and a copy solution on the internet is not, uh, is not viable. And uh, like, uh, so, so, so that's, the, that's the thing, right? So uh, previously before this class, well, because I was a part of UC San Diego. So I have been starting teaching CSE 141 since 2012. And I have taught many, many classes. And then uh, I moved to NC State University. That was actually my first uh, uh, formal appointment. But however, later on, I still find that I love California. So 2019, I show up again in UC San Diego. I taught two summer session classes and I have my, uh, I have my formal appointment at UC Riverside. And uh, recently, uh, since the coronavirus pandemic. And okay, so reading quizzes are open book for sure. Okay, so since the coronavirus pandemic, I feel like, okay, right now I'm not working for either UC Riverside or UC San Diego. I'm working for the biggest campus of the UC system, which is UC Zoom right now. So I have my first UC Zoom class in 2020. Uh, uh, spring and I believe you guys will also be part of this UC Zoom class and I hope that we can have a very good experience with that. So uh, announcement, uh, log in to Pizaza and Canvas and check our website reading quiz due tomorrow before the class and uh, using the stand link for the lab lecture is going to start in about half an hour later and highly suggested you should take both classes together because um, my version of CSE 141, as you can feel, is a little bit different from the others, uh, from other professors, and uh, it's, it's going to be more software oriented comparing with uh, uh, some of the traditional content. And for the, for the lab stuff, I think uh, we are also trying to uh, make it as easy, well, not saying that, right, uh, make it uh, align with the course that we are having. So, um, so and uh, uh, the reference is easier to found, uh, to be found on the, uh, the, the textbook as well. So I, I and we, 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 we taught the class, both classes in this way so that they can help each other. So for the lecture, we put most of the software related stuff in a, in a, in a class. And for, we put all, we, I dump all the hardware stuff on a textbook that I don't want to deal with to the lab part. So that's the structure of the class. And, you are highly encouraged to take both together uh, with the same instructor. So, um, uh, so we are using the textbook uh, called Computer Organization, uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not the uh, Computer Architecture book. Uh, that's a typo, so I will change that. Uh, other than that, uh, any question? Any question from you guys? If you have question, raise your hand because your question might be other people's question. Okay, I have Richard. 
Hey, so I, I know someone answered on Piazza for the 141L that we can work in groups up to three, but I had yeah. seen on one of your previous websites that we well, couldn't do that for, for lab one. Except for lab one, you should group into three. And we will explain okay. that in the lab lecture later. Okay? Okay, thanks. All right. Okay, um, question? Um, to Matt? Oh, uh, Thomas, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just, I'm just wondering where we can find the, uh, the lecture slides. Well, the lecture slides will be on the website. Oh, cool. Okay, thanks. Okay, so Anua? Yeah, I was just kind of confused about the uh, office hour timing. So, like, originally the uh, the main introduction Piazza post, I clicked on the link to register for the Zoom for the office hours, and it puts it like later from like 2 to 3.30 p.m. Um, but, you know, like what we mentioned well, here. Well, ignore, ignore about the time. The time doesn't matter. It's just oh, late. Okay. Yeah. okay, I'll just follow what's on the, uh, the class website calendar. Okay, okay. Yeah. Awesome, all right, thank you. Anything else? All right, if not, I will meet you tomorrow at, at the same time at 2 p.m. Uh, so other than that, uh, yeah, I will meet you tomorrow.